Welcome to Second Take, the show that takes a look at the issues behind the news. ESCOM is back in the news for all the wrong reasons. Terence Creamer joins me to discuss the crisis and whether there is any way out of it. Hi Terence. Hi Chanel. Load shedding is back. What are the causes and is there any relief on the near term horizon? Well, the immediate cause is really the very poor performance of the coal fleet. Um, which is not just the old, uh, very mature fleet, which is now our average age of 37 years old, where we know there's a huge maintenance backlog, but we're also not getting any support from the new units coming in from Madupi and Kusile, which are operating well below their nameplate capacity. And it seems like there are s more than teething problems. There are some serious defects that have to be remedied. And it's not really clear whether those uh, defects will be sorted out very soon. And as we uh, commercialize some of the other units, whether those will be repeated. So that's going to be a major focus. But of course, uh, we've got the, the perennial problem of a lack of maintenance uh, that's really been biting us for many years. It goes back more than a decade now of this maintenance problem. And uh, the issue is that it's a number of straws that are breaking this camel's back. One is, uh, I think, the popular notion that there is a lack of skill at Eskom. I think that's got an element of truth to it. There has been an exodus of some technical skill. There's been, obviously, the coal shortages and the primary energy problems and the quality problems around coal. That also has an element of truth to it. But I think uh, there's also the fact that we took so long to start building new capacity. Uh, that, is that policy paralysis uh, that goes back uh, decades, really, back to 1998, where a policy change was made but never implemented, and then Eskom was told at the very last minute to start building. Uh, it really goes to the fact that they started building two mega projects simultaneously uh, at a time when they didn't have a final engineering design and really, uh, that is really coming back to those, those projects. And uh, that's been a lot of focus of the money and the attention. And uh, that's also sucked the resources out of uh, Eskom and, and attention out of Eskom. And therefore, uh, the, the maintenance has been left to get worse and worse at, at the existing fleet. So now we have an energy availability factor of around that 70% level. If that, uh, we're having to rely on diesel a lot more. And uh, when you talk about an immediate uh, remedy, I suppose it really does come down to getting the shoulder to the wheel and trying to get these plants uh, that are, have a nameplate capacity of around 45,000 megawatts somewhere close to meeting the current load, which is, uh, which is actually below 30,000 megawatts. So it's a real uh, worrying situation and one that I think uh, has been a sort of death by a thousand cuts so you can't point to one thing or one element. There's a number of elements uh, that they've all combined. And every now and then we dip back and as a nation we focus on it, but they never really go away. Will the proposed split of ESCOM help? I think in terms of the load shedding crisis, no, that won't have any immediate uh, assistance to that. That's really going to be about diligent maintenance, getting the Madupi and Kusilia units up, deciding whether to finish. I think Kusilia is going to be a major issue to consider, considering that uh, we, at the, the units are not going to perform, it seems, at the sort of advertised levels. Uh, and whether that's forever or just temporary, we, we really don't know for now. So decisions have to be made around finishing Kusilia, I think. But uh, uh, the, the unbundling, uh, my concern about it is it might uh, distra distract management even further because a lot of attention has to go into the restructuring and uh, we've got a crisis on our hands. But I think it is going to take some time uh, legally and technically to do the unbundling and I think one of the issues is that uh, um, they, they're going to have to go through a consultation process as well with labor and other stakeholders. So I think there is some time uh, that, will, that will give us some breathing space to focus on the immediate crisis and allow some uh, of the executives to focus on the restructuring. But it's, uh, I think really it's an important signal for the long term. So it's in the short term, it really doesn't give us any relief from the load shedding. But what it does is it signals that uh, we are serious about getting Eskom fit for the future. And we've known actually since 1998 that it's not fit for the future because our policy said we need to try to separate uh, generation, transmission and distribution. We need to have 
transmission really playing the conductor role in the orchestra. Uh, that is the electricity supply system that, uh, that can sort of procure and manage and operate the system uh, and buy electricity on a merit order basis, so buying the cheapest first, whether that is coal, whether that is from, a, from their own Eskom fleet or whether it's from an independent power producer or whether it's renewables or whether in the future batteries, etc. So I think uh, it's an important signal for the future. It's part one component in getting Eskom uh, turning, uh, turning around Eskom, uh, but I don't think for the immediate crisis that we're facing, in fact, um, I don't think it's going to help immediately, but, but uh, uh, and in fact it could, if not well managed, make things worse. But uh, I'm hoping that it was the signal that's being sent is one that we are serious about Eskom, we're serious about its long-term sustainability, its fundability, and I think that um, those lenders that have been throwing money at Eskom now for many, many years and our uh, eyes are widening around a 420 billion debt pile and uh, the, the, the trajectory moving towards a 600 billion type level need to know that there's going to be a sustainable business that can pay back that money. And it, in its current form, the vertically integrated form, uh, really that is not fit for the future and uh, the utility death spiral is just going to make things worse from a profitability as well as a, um, as a from a bondholder perspective, a sustainable funding model. So I think it is an important signal. What are the immediate priorities for overcoming the operational and financial crisis? I think the immediate priority for the operational perspective definitely to get this uh, handle on this maintenance. Now that may require a more a sort of consistent level of load shedding, which is not going to be popular. And I see the president has said we need to try and get that out the way. So if we are not going to be load shedding, I suppose uh, the priority then is to find uh, different sources of supply. Do we go back to short term contracts with those uh, around us, both in the region and in the country that can sign uh, short term power purchase agreements with Eskom, which we did in the past? I think it does suggest that we need to get this integrated resource plan um, finalised so that the procurement rounds for the next uh, capacity uh, needs to be start being pr procured, both the renewables, the variable renewables uh, rounds, which we know we've already been very successful in procuring a lot of renewables and in uh, sort of lowering the tariffs that we, we get from those renewable plants. But we need to move also on the gas, uh, uh, gas to power project and we need to move quite speedily on that because uh, it really complements the renewables and it will probably also help complement the gaps that will be rising now in the, with this maintenance and the fact that the energy availability factor we now have to really factor in at a much lower level than the 80% target. I think even Eskom is now looking more at the 72% level for the next few years. So uh, th those are the immediate uh, issues. but. Um, Everything has to be framed within the financial viability of Eskom. The company is heading towards uh, the wall um, by the end of March or the end of this financial year. I think it's already seen as technically insolvent. It's going to need some sort of support from the shareholder. Now what form that support takes um, is going to be very interesting. Uh, obviously we know the mooted $100 billion uh, dollar um, round of debt being transferred from Eskom's balance sheet across to the National Treasuries that's been in the system for some months. We'll have to see what the Finance Minister says about that next week. We've had a leading economist warning against that and saying rather that maybe uh, um, the government should be looking on taking on Eskom's debt servicing costs for, for a limited period to give it some relief but without changing the shape of South Africa's debt, which is probably going to trigger a Moody's downgrade. A Moody's downgrade comes with all sorts of consequences for the country. So those, that, that's going to frame everything, I think, for the next week. That's going to be the focus. But there's also, if we're going to have a successful turnaround uh, plan at Eskom, uh, the key component here has to be labour. And the fact that labour has been left out for so long is a real problem because I think you've got a, a big organisation, 48,000 workers, at least uh, 18,000 of those unionised. I'm sure more because there's more than one. There's more than one union, but 18,000 through the NUM, and I think that has to be the priority for the coming week. Other than what Tito Mbaweni has to say in his budget speech on Wednesday, 
the focus of the uh, public enterprises minister and possibly the president himself has to be to engage more heavily with Labour and I think the signal was given in the response to the State of the Nation that's going to happen but that's a major gap and a major risk factor and it has to be prioritised with urgency. Thank you. That's the second take show for this week. Thank you for watching and join us again next time for more news analysis.